Hi, I'm Scott Sipker. And I'm Amanda Mullen. Welcome to this slightly warmer springtime edition of Iowa Outdoors. On this edition of Iowa Outdoors, we'll descend alongside a group of spelunkers inside the state's largest known cave system. We'll stake out in the grasslands of southern Iowa, waiting for a glimpse of a seldom seen native bird. Chef John Benedict shares a breakfast recipe for mouth-watering campfire sandwiches. We'll show you how to move and preserve a 100-year-old bridge with a little help from the Iowa National Guard. And we'll spend some time with Iowa's own Maynard Reese, a living legend in the world of wildlife art. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reap Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. We're at Wapsipinigan State Park located near Anamosa. Dedicated in 1923, it's one of Iowa's first state parks, and it's easy to see why. The gurgling Dutch Creek feeds into the Wapsie River. As limestone bluffs line the central valley of this 394 acre state park. Legend has it that a young Native American maiden named Wapsie and her lover Pinnikin plunged their death after jumping from a bluff overlooking the nearby river. Tucked underneath one of the park's outcroppings rests another tall tale of days long past. According to local legend, two horse thieves once used this cave for their campsite, storing away dozens of stolen horses in this cliffside chamber, dubbed now Horse Thief Cave. It's just a taste of history and geology in Iowa. More than 100 miles north, near the Minnesota border, rests a spelunker subterranean paradise, an underground grotto known as Coldwater Cave. If you close your eyes and picture a mental image of Iowa, this is likely not what comes to mind. A massive underground cave system stretching for miles underneath the karst topography of Northeast Iowa. Coldwater Cave is kind of a cave uh, in a glass by itself. Um, you don't find uh, things like this in Iowa, especially underneath a cornfield or a pasture. You just don't expect to see it. Um, Size-wise, it's, it's so huge. Um, main passage is so big and large, it's like a subway tunnel. Most Iowa caves are uh, small, wet, muddy, and uh, not really pleasant. Despite its size, the conditions and means of descending into Coldwater Cave are not for the casual tourist. The crew of Iowa Outdoors met up with members of the Iowa Grotto, a seasoned group of cavers intent on safely sharing the subterranean wonders of our state. Tucked inside a modest shed and bunkhouse rests the main human-built entrance to cold water. A metal tube and ladder descending 100 feet into the darkness below. Next bag! After lowering our television gear to a platform at the base of the ladder, it's time for my first journey under Iowa's surface. I'm thinking, don't miss a step. Make sure each, uh, there's something below my foot every time I put the weight on it. And it uh, should be fine. When you finally get down here, there's a little bit of relief double check that the ground's there. And then uh, it was great, I had a nice private moment just kind of coming over here, and it was completely dark, I couldn't see anything. And I just pressed the button on my headlamp, and all of a sudden it just seemed to go forever. And it was this beautiful, like, awe-inspiring moment, just really very, very humbling. Can't wait to go down there and uh, see what else is there. The absolute awe of an alien environment is 
nearly as eye-opening as the water temperature, hence its name. Coldwater Cave resembles an Iowa stream with water levels that fluctuate due to rainfall or snowmelt that eventually dumps into the nearby Coldwater Creek. Our journey, planned for the frigid winter days of February, came amidst an untimely thaw. Raising the water level to our waistlines and pumping icy snowmelt beneath the topsoil and through the cave. We have a spotless, actually, safety record. We've had just very few minor injuries over the years. We watch the weather. Just like today, we're not taking you in very deep. Chances of spring runoff, water levels coming up. Water temperature, air temperature, you've noticed even some of you are starting to feel effects, early effects of hypothermia. Uh, basic caving requires a hard hat and at least three light sources. Here we go to a wetsuit. Those wetsuits help by creating a thin barrier of body heat and warmer water next to the skin. But our guides peg the day's water temperature near 37 degrees with air temperature at a balmy 47. We head upstream to higher ground and I realize that safely traveling a small section of this cave takes time and patience. This is a beautiful area, but you also gotta realize you can get a long ways into this cave, have a problem, and it can get very serious. I think you've all noticed just getting back out of here if you had somebody injured would be a major undertaking. So we've, we've always stressed safety up here and we will continue to. If you can safely navigate cold water, slippery rocks, and icy water flow, you'll discover some spectacular scenery. A mix of formations dot the landscape, many of which were developed by mineral-laden water over thousands of years. Some descend as stalactites from the ceiling or stalagmites from the cave floor, while newer formations like these soda straws are just beginning to take shape. The earliest sediments that have been dated in the cave are around a quarter million years old. Scientists would consider this a fairly young cave, just based on a variety of technical indicators. This is the best place in Coldwater Cave to view fossils. These are crinoids, also known as celoids. They're more than 450 million years old. There are some pretty spectacular crinoid beds here in the cave. Basically, it's a case where the sla a slab from the ceiling peeled off the ceiling and ended up on the floor, and now we're able to walk on top of that slab. Uh, crinoids we know today as sea lilies in the oceans of the world. From fossils to flowstone, Coldwater Cave can present a variety of photographic opportunities. I've seen probably eight, nine miles of the whole thing on, on photography trips through the years. Scott Dankoff has photographed Iowa's tunnels and caves for nearly 20 years, but some of his best work originates from the crown jewel of Iowa's underground environment, cold water. Lighting's the biggest issue in this cave. Um, the walls, depending on where you're at in the cave, uh, dark colors eat your light. Uh, the water uh, eats your light. Um, you have to use larger flashes, um, carry more gear. Everything has to be in uh, waterproof boxes. Um, large passages like we're in now, not a big deal. Carry a tripod and a, and a pelican box is what we use most of the time. You get into small passages, hands and knees, in the water, crawling, the whole different thing. To date, explorers have discovered nearly 20 miles of winding passages at Coldwater Cave. It's a journey that began more than 40 years ago. Discovered in the 1960s by a trio of divers near Coldwater Creek, the cave captured the attention of Iowans and state government. Local farmers Ken and Wanda Flatland had suffered numerous sinkholes on their land and heard stories of other farmers that had lost livestock down mysterious holes. Experts later discovered Coldwater Cave ran directly underneath a section of the Flatland farm. With financial backing from the state legislature, the Iowa Geological Survey drilled a 94-foot hole for visitors to descend into the largest known cave system in the upper Midwest. But state officials quickly discovered it was not a casual tourist destination and scrapped plans for lighted concrete walkways. The raw nature of Coldwater Cave has kept spelunkers coming back time and time again. Divers say the network of passages will still be here long after they're gone, but concede the cave faces challenges from human contact and runoff from farm fertilizers. 
So you think, you know, we're an ag country, we're not too far from a college town, but you are truly in a wilderness, you know, where once you enter the cave and travel for some time, you can be two or three miles from the nearest exit, which, you know, from the definition of wilderness, it certainly is. It's the ultimate Iowa outdoors. In a way it is. Yeah. A bit underground, but yeah. It is. The gently rolling hills of southern Iowa is a far cry from Scott's adventures in an underground cave. Thousands of acres now occupied by prime farmland was once an ocean of prairie grasses. But a restoration project is bringing back the sights and sounds of a long lost native bird known as the prairie chicken. It's an hour before sunrise on the chilly plains of south central Iowa when a steady stream of headlights begin to resemble the final scene from Field of Dreams. One by one the vehicles descend on a small parking lot surrounded by acres of restored prairie. Bird watchers, families and retirees begin to take their front row seats for a show they'll likely hear before the day's first light sneaks over the horizon. This is sunrise at the Kellerton Grasslands, home to a growing number of prairie chickens. A native bird some Iowans may have heard of, but rarely have witnessed with their own eyes. You're really gonna see a lot of displaying of, of the males, um, almost displaying like the turkeys do to some degree in that um, the, the, the chattering of the feet, the displaying of the tail, uh, the interesting thing about the greater prairie chickens is the air sacs that they illuminate, you know, or um, uh, make larger, and then that's how they make the uh, the, uh, the humming noise that they do. That's really really awesome. Uh, and when the wind's not blowing, uh, you can hear that for a long ways away. But uh, they're bouncing around. They're trying to um, attract a female mate. And um, if you're out on a lek, there may only be one or two males that mate with several hens. A lot of the other ones that are displaying are not going to uh, get the opportunity to breed because they're less dominant birds. Basking in an early morning glow, Iowa's prairie chickens look as vibrant as ever, but our state's tiny population is only a fraction of what it was one century ago. Homesteaders and the state's first farmers pushed the birds off their native habitat of prairie grass and cultivated the rich soil for generations of agricultural production. By the 1980s, prairie chickens had largely disappeared from Iowa's countryside. The state's modern population rebound has not been easy. DNR wildlife specialist Chad Pop says today's small number of less than 50 birds was decades in the making. We essentially extirpated them from the state of Iowa to where there was, there was there's probably no native species here. Uh, we actually translocated these birds uh, out of Kansas uh, back in the, in the 90s. We put them in several counties, but this is the only place they really took hold. According to Pop, the small number of birds will likely confront genetic viability issues. Caused by inbreeding, future generations could breed eggs that fail to hatch, or birds could perpetuate poor genetic diversity. It would be a blow to one of Iowa's growing resources for bird watching. The boom and hum of Iowa's prairie chickens can bring more than 100 visitors to the rolling plains near Mount Air, Iowa. I saw two blue eyes. In an effort to document the flood of springtime visitors, a group of Iowa State students surveyed many of the region's binocular wielding attendants. Bird watching and, and attending this event is a non-physically uh, demanding thing. So people who are handicapped, people who are old, can definitely participate in this event and uh, benefit from it. But it wasn't just old people that were here today. There were families and there were um, kids who were all elementary students. There were some high school students. The economic impact of guests was apparent in the DNR survey. More than 85% of the visitors were non-locals traveling over 15 miles, and 80% came to the region for one reason, to witness Iowa's prairie chickens. We can identify that there's an economic impact here with, with the prairie chickens. This then allows the community to get behind it makes it easier for the community to get behind habitat restoration and uh, the, to 
identify that there is in fact a value to having these birds on the landscape. Kellerton's springtime stars have a following, and that attention could bring more conservation dollars for an initiative looking to expand. Pop envisions Southern Iowa could one day become a bird watching destination on par with other notable Midwestern sites. Just like uh, the Sandhill Cranes out in uh, central Nebraska, the uh, Eagles uh, at Keokuk along the Mississippi, and just a whole host of uh, wildlife species. Spring thaw can bring out plenty of Iowa's wildlife from winter hibernation. Warming temperatures may have the same effect on park visitors as well. As Chef John Benedict shows us, a warm campside sandwich may be the best way to start or end the day. Hi, I'm Chef John Benedict, and welcome to my Central Iowa campsite, where I'm going to be cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner with a pie iron off a warm and cozy campfire. I'm going to start out today with some cinnamon rolls. I have a pie iron here that I'm going to spray with a little bit of pan spray on the bottom and on the top. And I have some pre-made cinnamon rolls here that I'm going to squish out a little bit, put two of them in the pie iron, close it up. I'm going to put it right over my uh, campfire here. Probably take about five to ten minutes, churning it every couple minutes on each side. All right, while our cinnamon rolls are cooking, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to make a quick and easy breakfast sandwich. I'm going to spray it on each side of our pie iron with just a little bit of pan spray. And I'm going to fit in a piece of wheat bread. You know, you can use white bread or pumpernickel if you're making a Reuben, whatever you like. Put in a little piece of cheese. Then I got some pre-cooked scrambled eggs and some sausage that I cooked at home before I went camping. This will make for a quick and easy sandwich that I won't have a whole lot of cleanup for. I'm going to go ahead and fit in as much as I can in there. Pack it in. Top it with another piece of bread. And you can put any sort of filling in here from eggs, sausage, bacon. Put it right next to our cinnamon rolls. We'll let that cook for about five to seven minutes. You know, there's a lot of variations that we can do with these pie irons. And one of them is a dessert filling here with a little cream cheese. I'm going to spoon on just a little bit of pie filling. And it can make a wonderful dessert while you're out camping. Well, our cinnamon rolls have been cooking for about eight or nine minutes now. And they are looking great, nice and golden brown and ready to eat. Go ahead and pull them out. You know, the nice thing about these cinnamon rolls coming in the two pre-made is they come with the frosting already, and they make for a great quick breakfast while you're out camping. A little later in the day, one of my favorite sandwiches to eat is a Philly cheesesteak sandwich. And with these pie irons, it makes them really easy to cook over the campfire. You know, out of all these pie iron style sandwiches, my favorite would have to be dessert. At the end of a long day of camping, cozy up to a wonderful campfire, there's nothing better than a cherry pie with a little bit of cream cheese filling. For some great outdoor recipes from the campfire, please visit Iowa Outdoors website at iptv.org. Iowa is home to roughly 24,000 bridges, ranging from massive concrete overpasses to the covered wooden planks of Madison County. But few of those structures have had such a journey as a hundred-year-old walkway located right here at Wapsie Pennington State Park. This is Hale Bridge. Its journey miles downstream was not the result of a hundred years flood. It descended from hundreds of feet above with the help of some very determined Iowans. Built in 1879 by the King Bridge Company, this bowstring bridge spanned the Wapsipinikin River in eastern Iowa. But more than 100 years of wear and tear and the cyclical rise of Iowa's rivers took its toll. With Hale Bridge scheduled for replacement in 2002, a small band of volunteers stepped forward to preserve the wrought iron structure for future generations. After raising the necessary funds to restore Hale Bridge, these determined Iowans reserved the best moving team our state has to offer. The Iowa Army National Guard equipped with a pair of massive Chinook helicopters, carried three bridge sections airborne in 2006. The heaviest piece weighed in at 19,600 pounds, only 400 shy of the chopper's carrying capacity. More than 15 miles upstream, each span was neatly placed in its new location as hundreds watched in awe. 
Hale Bridge now links visitors to the natural wonders of Wapsipinicon State Park and carries with it an unrivaled history amongst the thousands of structures that span Iowa. Much of our state's wildlife and landscape has been captured by many artists in their own way. But in the world of duck stamp art, Iowa is home to a living legend. Maynard Reese has won nearly every award imaginable for his wildlife art, most of which has famously showcased Iowa's waterfowl. Maynard is in his early 90s, but is far from retirement. He can now look back on a life full of art, awards, and quality time with nature. There is a place where it is possible to enjoy Iowa's outdoors, indoors. The Maynard Reese Gallery in Des Moines. While it's safe to say that he is Iowa's predominant wildlife artist, the name Maynard Reese is internationally known and his skills have taken him all over the world, painting wildlife in all sorts of environments. My wife and I were in Antarctica in January of one year, and in June of the same year, we were up in the Arctic Ocean at both ends of the earth. And I was sketching and painting all the time. Reese was born in 1920 in Arnold's Park, Iowa, on Lake Okaboji. He tells people he was only 100 yards of being a duck, and he spent a large amount of time exploring and taking advantage of the area's natural wonders. His first step towards becoming an artist came when he was only 13 years old. I did a little pencil drawing of mallards. I was in a little school. We didn't have any art classes or anything, but uh, the teacher saw it and decided to send it in to the Iowa State Fair. And I won first prize and a dollar and a half, the most money I ever had in my life. And I bought art supplies, that's what I wanted and needed. So I was off and running and I knew what I wanted to do. Because his family was poor, Reese never received a formal art education. He did, however, have a mentor in Ding Darling, a cartoonist for the Des Moines Register. Darling often commented on issues concerning conservation and preservation. He was recruited by FDR to serve on the President's Committee for Wildlife Restoration, was the founder of the National Wildlife Federation, and was often referred to as the best friend a duck ever had. I went in to see him and I was scared to death. He had a very gruff, strong voice and he took one look at my stuff. He says, well, I can tell you it's nice and it won't do you any good, or I can tell you what's wrong with it. What do you want? And I said, I want to learn. So we were friends from then on. After a brief stint at Meredith Publishing, Reese began working at what is today known as the State Historical Museum. He spent his time collecting specimens for the museum and on the artwork for Iowa's Fish and Fishing, the book, published by the Iowa Conservation Commission, was instrumental in launching Reese's career as a freelance artist. I had a fish tank in the office there and the DNR would bring species of fish in and, and I would paint them. I always demanded I had to see every fish alive. I, a dead fish is, is not an interesting thing at all. Having tackled Iowa's fish, Reese moved on to the rest of the country. Life magazine took the bait, and for nearly three years he traveled the U.S. painting the fresh and saltwater fish of North America. Those things spawned other jobs from Sports Illustrated, Saturday Evening Post, and all different types of magazines. For most people, the first image that comes to mind when they hear the name Maynard Reese is probably a painting of waterfowl rather than fish. He says that his favorite thing to paint is water, and surprisingly, no matter what his subject matter, he tries to eliminate as much detail as possible. What detail is there has got to be very effective and correct. And uh, artist painting, a person doesn't put seven fingers on a hand, and a bird artist doesn't put uh, X number of feathers on a wing, and you know that there's 10 primaries and 10 secondaries and so many scapulars and so forth. So 
uh, you just do that automatically. Over the years, Reese has published over 400 editions of prints. His art has raised millions of dollars for conservation and preservation programs. He has been the National Ducks Unlimited Artist of the Year, the Iowa Pheasants Forever Artist of the Year, and the Iowa Ducks Unlimited Artist of the Year. He has designed more than 30 different stamps for various conservation organizations and is the only artist to win the Federal Duck Stamp Competition five times since Ding Darling created the program in 1934. In 1998, a 125-acre wetland in North Iowa was named the Maynard Reese Marsh in recognition of his contributions to conservation. When I made the dedication to it, I told the people that were there that the ducks and I uh, complimented them and appreciated what they did for us. At the age of 90, Reese says he slowed down a bit and paints only three or four pictures a year. He has one very important painting that he calls The End, which he will be working on right up to his final days. It's a painting of 90 mallards, and Reese plans on adding another mallard for every birthday he celebrates. We hope he'll be adding ducks for quite some time. What I hope people get out of my painting is an interest in wildlife and in nature and once they become interested in it, then they'll be more anxious to conserve it. And that's what I hope people get out of my painting. That wraps up this edition of Iowa Outdoors. We're going to leave you with a few more sights and sounds of Southern Irish prairie chickens. But before we do, we'd like to encourage you to step outside, shake off the wintertime blues, and enjoy some of Iowa's outdoor opportunities. Hey, Scott. Yeah. Did you know that Iowa's caves stretch for miles and miles underground, and that not even all the areas have been explored, and that the divers at Coldwater Cave have explored nearly 20, 20 miles? miles? Yeah, I was in the story. You remember it was just on. Yeah, but you only know that because they told you. That's not true, but I knew that before. Yeah, well, I knew that when I was born. Did you know that you should not wear cotton socks underneath your neoprene socks? Yes, I did know that. How did you know that? Because I know everything. That is not true. It's so true. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reap Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.